Welcome. Um, I think it was two or three months ago, Barb, Denny, Jenna, and I got together for dinner and said, we want to do something to focus on parenting and brainstormed a bunch of different ideas and came up with this as kind of step one. And, um, and then we sent the email out asking for questions. And frankly, at first, almost no one replied. So Sunday in the elder meeting, we were talking through questions that I would ask so that we could then answer those same questions that I asked. And then Scott sent out the email on Monday and the floodgates opened. Um, I think we got somewhere definitely over 50 questions. Um, so the way we're gonna do this is a speed round. Um, I'm gonna ask a question, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, so as we've talked about how to kind of go after answering as many of those questions as possible, there frankly weren't that many overlapping questions. Um, we wanted to kind of talk through parenting in principle and try to answer as many questions as we can um, through some of the principles. And then there's some direct questions that we have that were asked. So if you asked a question and it doesn't get answered directly, um, this is step one of what we want to do to kind of focus more on parenting as a church and be able to, to shepherd in that. Um, there will probably be another one of these and maybe some parenting classes. We'll just see where it goes from here. But this is definitely step one. So if you would like to come back or catch me or any of us after the service and ask your question or if we didn't answer it directly, that's what we're here for. Um, and so we're going to do our best tonight. So I'm going to start by grabbing my notes. And um, Omri, I think we said to start just by you answering the question, um, why is it important that we parent biblically? And what is the significance of having a biblical approach to discipline in your home? Yeah, the reason uh, that this area of life, parenting, is important uh, really shares the, the same answer with anything else you could fill in the blank, and, and that's because God intends parenting for his glory. Uh, through our parenting, our children, um, our spouses, um, even ourselves, we, we should be beholding the glory of God as we seek to navigate parenting uh, in the home. And, and what I mean by that is uh, God's goal in all things is to be known and worshiped. Uh, that's why he created all things. Uh, the heavens declare the glory of God uh, to him, from him, through him, to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Romans eleven thirty six. And so in parenting, parenting should be a, a realm of life where we are beholding the glory of God. Uh, God the Father um, in his patience and wise instruction, in his kindness, in his uh, grace. I mean, all of those things should be in seed form present uh, or able to be seen manifested in in parenting. That's why it's uh, mostly important. Yeah, and I think that plays into the idea that we're not just parenting out of convenience. Like, I'm not just parenting because I want a quiet home or I want kids to do what I ask, but I'm doing it because I want to put on display God's glory in my home. So, yeah. Um, as I think about that, there's a few principles that come to mind um, as like baseline principles that you need to have in your home to be able to parent well. Um, some of the ones that I wrote down, and we, we have handouts. There's a stack of them in the back if someone could hand them out, but they have, there's something like 10 or 15 pages of resources that Denny put together for us. Um, some of these things we'll reference. Some of them are just really, really helpful. Um, and one of those handouts is 25 ways to provoke your children to anger. So obviously there's a commandment in Ephesians 6.4 that says fathers do not provoke your children. Um, the 25 ways is really helpful to think through, oh, what are things that I do in my home that could be provoking my children? And I captured a few of them. One of them is just a lack of marital harmony. Um, we can't have a fun parent and a mean parent. Um, my home actually does kind of have a fun parent and a mean parent and it's not helpful. So I try to be more mean, um, <laughs> but my kids clearly answer that question with, you're the fun parent. And, and that isn't helpful. That, that actually is a baseline way 
for kids to be exasperated. Um, another way is to maintain a child-centered home. Centered home. Um, and what I mean by that is kids that rule the home, kids that dictate what's going on, kids that decide um, just what the temperament of the home is, um, that actually ends up provoking children to anger. Um, and then another one is to model sinful anger. Uh, this is something you know we talk about and build, we talk about throughout the church, of shepherd your heart first so that that can then seep out and be the aroma of your household. If the aroma of your heart is anger, the aroma of your household will be anger. Um, and then the last one I noted, obviously it's four of 25, um, but inconsistency has a, it creates frustrated children, creates angry children. Um, if they don't know what the expectations are, that's going to provoke them to anger. Um, and so those are the things that, as I looked through that list and just thought through what are some baseline principles we need to have in our home, we need to have those things to protect our children from, from being provoked to anger. Denny, did you have something you wanted to add? Well, in regard to uh, consistency uh, versus inconsistency, um, I, I have written down a number of quotes. Um, one of uh, Barb and I's pledges is that when we were in the midst of uh, seasonal discipline uh, with our kids is that we vowed to be in a parenting book as much as possible. And so uh, there are various quotes that we pulled from these books, and one of them uh, is by Ginger Plowman and says that if we fail to require obedience from our children, we become a stumbling block for them, and we are robbing our children of the blessings that God intends for them when we fail to require obedience. So God gave us children to raise, and he expects us to do it uh, according to his word, and uh, in a lot of times, uh, the list that Matt just read from, uh, a lot of the, or most all of them listed there, uh, the fingers are pointing to uh, inappropriate parenting rather than uh, just having an angry child. So uh, the first thing that we always ask when we, uh, when we start looking at disobedient children is that we first look at the parents and examine their methods. So inconsistency um, is, a, uh, is a problem. And uh, as uh, Omri indicated that uh, uh, kids, just like us, are worshipers and their lives are shaped and controlled by whatever they worship. And that means that every moment is a God moment. In every moment, a child is accepting his role as a creature and living in worship, full obedience to God, or he's exchanging God for some aspect of a created world that he that he is living in. Children don't typically think of themselves in this way, nor do their parents, so they need us, parents, to faithfully point out to them the nature of their actions. There is no more important piece of the Bible's description for parents than to do this job. So we are to examine our, our children's lives, we are to provide them feedback, and not only provide feedback, but we are to uh, speak into their lives in the area of discipline. I have a number of other things, Matt, but uh, we better move on. <laughs> if I could just add one, one other thing that's closely related to inconsistency in parenting. You know, when your rules are one thing on a Wednesday and then different on a Friday, uh, it's just the, if, if your children see hypocrisy modeled for them, where... Um, you know, when they go out with friends and church family, then they get one view of, of mom and dad. And, man, I wish they were like that in the home. Um, then your kids, that's going to embitter your children against uh, the gospel, against the God that you claim. Um, they'll, they'll leave home and want nothing to do with the church or God that you claim to serve if what they see in the home from us is uh, unconfessed sin, unrepented of uh, motivations, idolatries, uh, if we don't ever confess sin and seek forgiveness from our children when it's appropriate, uh, and yet 
they hear about those things happening at church, read about those things, and the scriptures are even made to practice those things from us as parents and don't see us model those things. That's a, a really another quick path to embittering our kids against us, the church, the scriptures. And the key difference between uh, biblical parenting and uh, worldly parenting is that in the primary objective in worldly parenting is to uh, address behavior. And in biblical parenting, uh, we are attempting to address the heart. And that's what you, uh, that's the area that uh, is the lifeblood of every action is, is our heart. So, um, so during that discipline process, um, you don't just want to be uh, someone that, who administers, administers the punishment. Um, disciplining children takes a, a long time. And a part of that process is digging into their, digging into their heart, finding out why they did something or what caused them to do it, and then to follow up with that and say, you know what, how could you have done that differently? And so then you go through a training process that uh, allows you to um, not only point out what was what they didn't do correctly, but then to train them in the proper way of doing it. It's like going to a football practice and, and uh, getting uh, uh, chewed out for not doing things right, but the coach never tells you how to do it correctly. So, uh, so anyway, uh, biblical parent, parenting uh, has to deal with, or we have to deal with the heart. Yeah, that, that's key. Um, Denny, I think this is a good opportunity for us to talk about the circle of obedience. Um, it, it answers the question of when do we need to be disciplining in the home? Um, so that's, I think, the cover of the handout. And I think, Scotty, are you going to be able to put that on the projector? Sweet. Um, so yeah, can you walk us through how you've used this in parenting? Well, the circle of obedience um, is a uh, communication device, and uh, you see the inner blue circle there, and uh, within the inner blue circle is an area that describes um, what it means to be uh, obedient, and that is uh, to, be, uh, to have self-control, to be kind, to be thankful, to be a peacemaker. On the outside, you see... Uh, there are six D's. We used to call them in our place the six deadly D's. And most every act of uh, disobedience or sin falls under those categories. So this, in, uh, in using this with your, uh, with your children, uh, you can sit down and walk through, okay, uh, what, uh, what part of your actions is inside the circle, in other words, it's obe being obedient, being safe, and what part of your actions is outside the circle. So you want to clearly indicate to them or describe to them what, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And so in just in, in working through this, uh, I mean, it, it gives you uh, clear boundaries and even though children will tell you that they don't like boundaries, they need boundaries. They love boundaries. If a child is out of control, um, he is, uh, if he's outside of uh, uh, any of those boundaries and just uh, uh, going about his own thing, for the most part, he's scared. He's scared because he doesn't know what to do. So this gives you, um, like I say, a, a chance to sit down and to go through what is acceptable, what's unacceptable. And there are even uh, points in, like with a, young, uh, a younger child, age two or three, and uh, let's say they get in trouble, they, they sin, and you could even have them sit down and say, okay, where are you at in the circle? And you give them a piece of paper, and they draw the circle, and they put their little X outside the circle. So what does, what does dad need to do? Uh, I need to be disciplined, and so then uh, it, it's not a matter of fighting the process. Both uh, are 
understand what needs to be done and you can work into the discipline process. So this is, uh, like I say, this is a communication device. Um, all, the six deadly deeds uh, are Ds. Um, you're not going to find too much outside of, and Barb and I didn't actually put this together. This was at the compliments of a of another uh, godly family that put this together, and so that's our circle of obedience. Did you have something you wanted to add? So, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about discipline. I think this is an opportunity for us to discuss the use of the rod. Um, scripture is riddled with verses that talk about the importance of the use of the rod. And that's also in your handout, and I'm looking at it right now. And you can see um, just so many verses in Proverbs that talk about um, the importance of it. Looking at Proverbs 22:15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Um, but I think there's some confusion on how to address that, that process. some confusion on where it is in my notes. Um, you know, using the rod is, we need to remember that this is a tool that God has given us to help address the heart. And so it, the correction that comes from using the rod needs to be rooted in that. Um, we can't do that well if we're sinning against our child in that moment. If we're angry from our heart and we're sinning against the child in that anger because they did something we don't like, that is not the appropriate time to use the rod. That is an appropriate time for you to go seek God to confess your sin to him, to confess your sin to your child, and to deal with your own heart. And so that is the underlying situation for the use of the rod, is you cannot do that when you're angry because you're sinning against the child and you're going to create... Um, what we talked about earlier, angry children. Um, there's, in that handout, uh, I think there's a list that's some, a really good suggestion of something like 10 steps for using the rod, um, or 10 steps in the process. I think what's important to remember is, is the purpose of it, which is getting to the heart of the situation, going to a kid um, and helping them understand that, that you, that they've sinned against a holy God and that they need to um, turn from that sin. So some of the notes I made is do this in private whenever possible. Um, it's not a means of public humiliation. Communicate a lot during the process. Um, even when they're young, they need to know why. Um, apply the rod consistently. I think my brother did this really well. He talked about um, having certain number of swats for different types of, um, of disobedience. And the kids would know, oh, this was a three swat situation or a two swat. And he was very consistent with that. That's really helpful. Um, comfort them and instruct them. Pray with them and for them. Um, hug them and show them you love them. Um, the way that you go about this is so important in what is going to happen when they become teenagers and the relationship you have with them as teenagers. You want them to know that, that you're a safe place for them to talk in, about their sin and that you're someone that prays with them about their sin and that you're someone that loves them in spite of their sin. And if you have that relationship with them when they're two, three, four, five, six, then when they're 13, 14, 15, 16, they're gonna have that same conversation with you, um, maybe outside the use of the rod. Um, and then have them seek forgiveness. Generally speaking, when you use the rod, they sin against somebody, whether it's disobeying their mother and you need them to go talk to their mother and seek forgiveness from their mother, or it's sinning against a sibling, or whatever, they need to go seek forgiveness. Um, so Denny, there's, there were several questions asked of us um, around the use of the rod. Um, can you answer a couple of these around just when is too old or too young? Um, are there considerations with fathers and daughters and are there times when spanking may not be the right form of discipline? Well, I'll attempt it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I want to um, uh, read a couple of things from um, Ted Tripp's book on shepherding a child's heart as to, to address when you begin to, uh, to discipline your child. And he says, when your child is old enough to resist your directives, he is old enough to be disciplined. When he is resisting you, he is disobeying. When you fail to respond, those rebellious responses become entrenched. The longer you put off disciplining, the more intractable the disobedience will become. Rebellion can be something as simple as an infant struggling against a diaper change or stiffening out his body when you want him to sit on your lap. The discipline procedure is the same as laid out uh, above. You have no way of knowing how much the child a year old or less can understand of what you say, but we do know that understanding comes long before the ability to articulate before the ability to, to articulate does. So the, um, um, you, you can begin to discipline as soon as they can understand saying when you direct them yes or no. And uh, so uh, what kinds of discipline? Well, uh, spanking for a 12-month-old uh, or a 15-month-old you probably want to do that cautiously, but there are, there are still ways, and you definitely do not use your hand, but you would use uh, some sort of a rod, and uh, you would either uh, spank them on the, uh, uh, a course on their bottom, or if it's uh, uh, a sin like uh, dropping food off of a tray, you might turn their hand over and uh, uh, spank the palm of their hand uh, giving them the sensation of pain and knowing that uh, not to do that is uh, preferential. So when a child is, uh, uh, of course, there's always a time to uh, put away the rod. And uh, the, that, that's tougher than, than when you start discipline. And uh, um, there's a couple of people that... Uh, uh, have made quotes about when to do that, and uh, Lou Priolo, who uh, is the author of, uh, who has that list of what anger, yeah, the heart of anger, he says, unless the Word of God penetrates their heart for change, the rod needs to penetrate their backsides. Well, that's, uh, um, well, we don't need to expound on that too much. John MacArthur, uh, a few years ago, came to Arizona uh, for a Q&A, and he was asked about uh, how old is it uh, too old to spank, and he gave the illustration of his 14-year-old daughter. Um, his, uh, the church where they, were, uh, where they were going, the youth group leader came and, and asked John, what, uh, what is, uh, what's up with your daughter? She is uh, distracted and somewhat disrespectful in class. And um, John made very little or no response. And a week later, uh, John's daughter returned to class. And after class, the, uh, the same youth group leader came and said, uh, asked John, he said, uh, what, what did you say to her? Because she's totally a different kid. And John said, I didn't have to use any words. So we know, we know that uh, she went into the, uh, uh, the spanking room. Um, in our home, uh, we didn't begin biblically, biblically disciplining until our kids were four, six, eight, and 10. And uh, so we, we used the rod uh, quite a ways into the, into the teen years. But um, you will know when your child is is too old. I mean, it's just a, uh, uh, I can't tell you the, uh, I spanked my boys when they were, uh, when they were in their teens, but I just knew um, w when it was time to uh, put the rod away. And there's still, uh, even though you put the rod away, there still has to be consequences. And, uh, uh, those consequences should go along with the uh, the nature of the sin, and 
those consequences uh, should be communicated up front, if possible, so that they know if they step across the line or they're on the uh, in the outer uh, outside the circle, so to speak, that uh, they're going to receive a consequence. And the consequence should be tough enough, should be painful enough, that they'll think two or three times before they do that, uh, cross that line again. I thought you almost said when they're in the outer darkness. Oh, <laughs> <not>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that could be. So um, was there a third part to your question? I Matt? think there were five. Five? <laughs> oh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think you hit on most of them. Um, one part, although you said it, is what are some other options as kids get older? Um, I know in our home, we, we have um, had kids seek out what God's word says about that sin. Um, years ago, Jenna, for our small group, put together some repentance homework. And part of what that repentance homework is, is to seek out what does God's word say about what you're dealing with in your own heart. And so what does God's word say about anger? What does God's word say about lying? Um, and so we've We've stolen that and used that with our kids. And so um, multiple of my kids have had to write pretty extensive papers on what God's word says about whatever situation they were in. Um, as they got old enough to be able to do that, that's been, that's bore a lot of fruit in our home. Let me just uh, comment. Um, I'm guessing in, in a context like ours, there are lots of parents who... Um, do utilize the rod, but oftentimes the the use of the rod is substituted for instruction, and that's not a good substitution. In a moment, right, thinking of when uh, a child's disobeying, clear disobedience, didn't follow through on what the child was told to do, or... Um, you know, has some ungodly response to a, a clear requirement in the home, oftentimes biblical parents will know that their child knows better and so say something to them, you know, repeat the instruction for the third or fourth time or, you know, do something to curtail the behavior and just want to, if it's helpful, um, disabuse us of the idea that instruction is a good substitute for discipline. Proverbs twenty nine nineteen says, by mere words, a servant is not disciplined, for though he understands, he will not respond. So when you find yourself having to repeat your instructions, why won't you just listen? Oh, it's because you, parent, mom, dad, didn't discipline after the first time disobedience occurred. Um, and I mean, Emily and I will look at each other sometimes and go, that's why I'm, I'm finding myself almost, or it's just saying, why do I have to keep saying this to you? And I'm like, that's an indictment on me as a parent. I'm having to tell you because, uh, I'm not requiring first time obedience by mere words. A servant is not disciplined. Words are not the same as discipline. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, just because this, this is, a, I think, increasingly popular in our day, uh, this idea that you don't have to, to discipline because in those moments when discipline is needed, you can instead choose to show grace. Um, and there's a number of problems with that. <laughs> uh, the first issue with that is that you're accusing God of not being gracious when he disciplines. And that's the absolute opposite of what we should think about discipline. Discipline is a gracious, loving act. Uh, Hebrews 12 and Proverbs 3, Hebrews 12 quoting Proverbs 3 say, uh, Do not despise the discipline of Yahweh, nor be weary of his reproof. For Yahweh reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So to accuse discipline or to withhold discipline under the banner of, I just want to show my kid grace this time, inadvertently, the parent accuses God's discipline, even his plan in the home, of not being gracious. It is a demonstration of grace 
when you choose to rescue your child from the foolishness of not submitting to God's authority to submit to parental authority. Um, the other issue with that is it actually, if we teach our children, okay, Johnny, instead of disciplining you, I'm going to show you grace because this is what God did in the gospel. He withheld his wrath. and You know, we actually, in doing that, teaching them that this is some picture of the gospel, give them a wrong view of the gospel even because Jesus endured wrath in place of the believer. Um, it's a wrong picture of God's forgiveness, a wrong picture of God's grace. That's not what happens in the gospel unless you want to go um, substitute one of your other children for the one who needs discipline. <laughs> that's another way. Maybe that's on the embittering list. 25 I don't ways have any book. kids that would volunteer for that. <laughs> <laughs> unless I mean, you have a willing substitute, don't do that. <laughs> that would be on the anger list. <laughs> Amri, um, talk a little bit about some of the special cases, uh, like foster kids or kids with special needs, what this looks like. Yeah, um, first off, with, with uh, the foster children issue is an easier one because the short answer for that about disciplining foster children is that they're not yours. Uh, Hebrews 12, and this was really instructive for Emily and I when we... Uh, we're thinking and preparing to foster into the, the several children that we ended up fostering. God tells us in Hebrews 12, verse 8, if, if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, that is all children, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. So anybody without discipline is not a legitimate child. Okay, we get that's, that's crystal clear. Foster children do not belong to the foster parent. Yes, the state has entrusted these foster parents with the care of children that actually belong uh, to the state. The state has exercised um, the sword in a sense, protecting the innocent, and has removed children from the, the parent's home. And so the state stepped into the realm of the home for the benefit of the citizen of the state and the parental right, at least for a time, hopefully only for a time, has been revoked from the birth parent. And so the foster parent should not feel the burden of treating those foster children as their own children. Um, we, I think initially for a short time, we used to think or say, we're going to love the foster children in our home the same way we love ours. No, we're not. They're not our children. And when we finally did adopt uh, Jonah, then he got to experience the blessed <laughs> privilege of sonship in discipline. Day one, home, home from the court. And uh, that's, that is a privilege of, of sonship. So that's the easier one. With, with special needs children, uh, that one's a little bit more difficult because you have legitimate uh, mental handicaps oftentimes. Uh, and, and so what's, what's certain, um, and you have to apply biblical principles um, and it might just require some nuance in your home with a, with a handicapped child, is where's, we, we have to train them to submit to God's authority by coming under our authority as parents. The difficulty, though, is in determining what's the, where's the line between ability and understanding, um, ability and rebellion, and sometimes that's a, a, a learning process. Um, we, don't, we don't have that situation in our home, uh, but I know families that do, and um, you're, you're just trying prayerfully, depending on the Lord, to, to discern uh, how much can they understand 
when they can uh, communicate things that they desire uh, to you, oftentimes that's, a, that's revealing of, of a level of understanding. Um, but where the child isn't communicative or is just slow in that regard, um, you're wanting to find out how much can they do, how much can they understand. And as soon as you know that they can understand, then they're on the hook for obedience. Uh, and, and the rod, um, the, the consistency in, in that discipline and training in the home, even in the, uh, the instruction, because the rod and reproof give wisdom, Proverbs says. And so you're marrying always the rod with words of wisdom, and uh, that's, that's how the training happens. That's helpful. And I, I think it's, it's also important to just go back to the reason why. Um, we're wanting to bring the gospel before these kids. And so it's, it's an opportunity to be able to do that through the act of discipline. So, Another thing that might be worth uh, mentioning in that regard, because I had a, a friend of mine who's a pastor remind me of this recently, is that uh, we're, we're two-part beings, soul and body. And so even where the body may experience some limitations in... Uh, just temporal ramifications of having a, a body that's experiencing the effects of the fall, the soul oftentimes can still understand. And this friend of mine was using the example of, of how he shepherded a family in his church uh, where the, the daughter uh, is not communicative. Um, she's in her teens or close to it, I believe. At this point, um, wheelchair bound, just um, lots of handicaps there and health challenges, but when when uh, some form of entertainment is withheld or ended, then she exercises her will in throwing a tantrum, and that's an indication that she can communicate what she wants in some way, just not verbally. And so he reminded this family as a, as their shepherd that the soul is engaged and can hear, can understand, can learn, even if she can't respond to you. And so don't just uh, put her in front of a TV all day. It was kind of the what he was dealing with is, hey, you can actually read to her, communicate the gospel to her. Um, you think about people in comas, the body can't respond, and yet the soul is is well aware. And so keeping those principles, those biblical principles of of anthropology in mind can even be helpful. So we're at, we're at Tintel. Um, we're going to go long. Uh, if you want to leave or need to leave, uh, just do it, and I won't be offended. But there's no way we're going to be done in 10 minutes, and I'm about to cut two pages of questions. Um, so let's move on from discipline. I, I, had, I cut a lot of questions just to try to get through my outline and I'm cutting pages of questions on discipline. So we're moving on from discipline, and I want to talk a little bit about discipleship. Um, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Deuteronomy 6. This is a very, very familiar verse um, and talks about uh, what discipleship should look like in the home. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5 says, You shall love Yahweh your lo God, with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons, and shall speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and, you shall, and they shall be as phylacteries between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates." There were a lot of questions about how do you go about um, family Bible time? What does discipleship look like? What are some of the ways that, um, or tips that you can interact with God's word with your kids? Um, and so I have some things that we've done in our home over the years that I think were fruitful. Um, some things that I think we did in the home uh, that were not as fruitful. Um, maybe they would work on your kids. Um, but I know when my children were younger, um, we had Bible time, and they were probably, 
I want to say, they were old enough that I could open up God's word and read it with them and that they were super excited to go get Froyo or ice cream with me and tried to pay attention. Um, and we would go one night a week. I took each of the three kids, depending on which, which, like, it was a rotation. So I didn't go out three nights a week. I went out one night a week over a three-week rotation. And we would go out, and we read First John together. And I would read it with my three-year-old. I'd read it with my seven-year-old. Um, and, and just spend time reading God's word together. And those times, as they got older, turned into asking questions about what's going on in their heart. And it was a great father-son or father-daughter time to interact with our with my kid one-on-one. -on -one. And, and that has turned into, as they've gotten older, the same time where we interact with each other and, and talk about just what's going on in their life. And we don't do, we don't go out for ice cream anymore. We just hang out now. Um, but maybe they want ice cream now. I don't know. Um, but that's been a really helpful tool that we've used in our home. We've also just had a lot of, you know, one of the things when Denny and I were talking about this a couple of days ago was the temperament in your home. If you're shepherding your heart well, then you're talking about God's word in every conversation. Then you're talking about what God's doing with you in your heart in every conversation. Your kids hear that. If you're a repenter, then you're confessing sin to your kids, and that's showing them what the gospel looks like. Um, and so a big piece of what does family devotions look like it's living out the gospel in your life in front of your kids. Don't hide it from them, but have them see what you're, what you're doing and how you're doing it. Um, is there anything you guys want to add? Because I could talk for another 20 minutes on this. Well, <clears throat> as a part of uh, what you do every day and even in uh, disciplining your children, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, very important. Because what you, what, who you are is chances are your children are going to emulate that uh, example. So love, joy, peace, patience, uh, gentleness, kindness, all of those things are, you should practice uh, in administering discipline, or like Matt just described, as being an example in your home. Those things, uh, living it out is uh, much, much, has a much greater impact then sitting down and doing a daily devotion and then you walking away and, and a, uh, looking like a hypocrite, so to speak. But uh, so living out that example, very important. And then um, just in all life situations, uh, there are various different times that uh, um, uh, most of my children played sports and there are various different times that they were involved in sporting activities where uh, their attitude was not in the right direction and uh, I, we would just pull them off to the side and say, hey, your attitude is, is not glorifying to God. So you, you need to do something with that attitude. And uh, usually the word of God penetrated their heart and, and uh, they went, uh, went out there with a different attitude. So um, it's just uh, walking in life is, uh, and, and you do this intentionally. You, you need to be aware of different uh, situations and opportunities that allow you to do that. And that's where it's very important to have a knowledge of God's Word and to be able to communicate that to your uh, sons and daughters. One thing that we do, and, and I've picked up things from different men in our church over the years, uh, Steve Kovac gave me the idea to not wait for bedtime to read something from Scripture because I mean, if you have little kids, you know, bedtime is like a Herculean effort just to get them down. Um, and parents are tired. So we just, during dinner, uh, in between bites, I'm at some point opening up my Bible, and we're just reading the next chapter. And uh, th that always includes a, a little bit of review. Um, where are we? What book comes before? What book comes after? Who are the characters? What's the last thing you remember? And then we just read uh, the next thing. And um, some of my best Bible insights come during those times. <laughs> we should probably read more. Uh, but, but it's not complicated. I'm not preparing. I'm not spending hours studying or anything like that. I'm just opening up to the next passage and we're reading. Um, I know the, the Kennedys are memorizing or Psalms. 
And so they sing psalms uh, together. And I mean, there's no like right or wrong way to do it. But uh, Don Whitney, is it Don Whitney? His book on uh, family worship, we have it at the book table, Super Little. Um, That would be great for every dad to have read uh, because if there's whatever you do, dads lead, (laughs) lead your family in uh, hearing you articulate truth and and what you're going after. And from there, memorize scripture, read scripture, use a catechism, uh, sing, do all of those things, whatever you do, uh, dads lead. Yeah, and I think that that has a little bit of a presupposition that you give yourselves time to be together. I think in today's world, there's so many things we can commit to that all of a sudden the week's over and we never had dinner together. Um, and so we found that happening when our kids were in the sports years. And so we pivoted at one point and said, we're only going to have one kid participate in sports at a time. And uh, because I think Jenna was coaching one kid's sports and I was coaching the other and I never saw Jenna's team play because I was coaching the other one. We're like, there's just no family time. And so we pivoted at that point. And then when, when I started the business, the kids had to drop out of sports. But, um, but a piece of that was we were, we were trying to protect family time. And I've been very intentional and diligent about protecting dinner. Um, it's very easy to have dinner on the run a lot. And that has been, I think, our most fruitful conversations come at the dinner table. And we've stolen from the Pagels um, recently, within the last few years, the highlights and lowlights of just talk about what the best thing that happened today and the, the difficult thing that happened today. And that's an opportunity to just bring God's word to bear on what's going on in your kids' hearts. It's a lot easier than how was school today. Fine. Cool. Um, moving on. Um, but ask, actually asking the highlights and lowlights um, helps you kind of dig into what's going on in your kids' hearts about what they're interacting with throughout the day. Um, it was a good thing to steal. Oh, well, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we also, we, we cherish dinner time too. And uh, the, uh, one of the things that uh, we brought current events uh, to the dinner table, someone would uh, bring an article out of a paper when there used to be newspapers. And uh, uh, so we would relate that to what's going on in the world. and, and uh, to give you an example, there was a, uh, a young lady that was uh, up on uh, ASU's campus, and uh, she was struck by a drunk driver and killed. So um, l- what, let's examine what happened here. And w- we examined that, well, the drunk driver was clearly uh, uh, outside of uh, uh, where he needed to be. We found out that the young lady was crossing the street, not in a crosswalk, but at an area that was uh, not um, appropriate. So we saw that both the drunk driver and the young lady uh, were in sin. And so it was just little examples like that that uh, allowed us to see um, what was appropriate and what, what was not. Hosting is not an impediment to family devotions. Uh, You should continue family devotions and host people and just rope in your friends into the the family time. You can tell them beforehand, hey, we usually do this for dinner or during dinner. Family devotion looks like this after dinner, whenever you do it, and invite them to join you. That can be a really encouraging time that helps spur other families on uh, in significant ways. Jackson led our family in singing a psalm recently. It was great. That's, I remember when Jonathan had a friend that was over at our house all the time, and he came over for dinner once, and we just started praying before the, for dinner, and he looked at us like we were aliens. Um, but it was a good opportunity to just show, like, even when kids are over, it's an opportunity to do it. Um, as the kids are growing up, I want to talk a little bit about parenting older kids. And so, Denny, since your kids are the oldest, um, what advice would you give parents of teenagers? <laughs> well, you can't, you can't get off the train um, at any, any time. So uh, as, a, um, uh, as kids enter their teen years, 
that is a uh, an extremely vulnerable uh, time for them, and uh, so um, some of what I wrote down was uh, parental affection is very powerful. Uh, it makes the parent and the parents God attractive. It communicates love and acceptance, and we might tell our children that we love them, but affection convinces them. It is a bridge over which love passes to our children. Affection is the hammer that drives the nail of true deep, of truth deep into their hearts. Uh, and it would be hard to overstate the importance of affection. And this is a quote uh, that comes uh, from one of the parenting books that we had. But when you, um, when you, when you think about uh, uh, the love that you have for your child and, and when they enter the teen, year, teen years, uh, their chances of uh, pulling away from you is, is pretty good because they're undergoing uh, changes in their environment, circumstances, uh, bodily changes, and all of those things uh, they may understand, most likely don't understand. So as a parent, being there, loving them, uh, showing affection, uh, accepting them for uh, whatever that they're going through, communication, very important. Uh, you just you want to be their resource when they seek out advice, and you don't want them to go to their friends. Um, you don't want them to go to uh, the opposite uh, uh, sex for uh, um, you know companionship and that type of thing. So the the environment that you create within your home, one of affection and loving kindness, uh, very very important as a child gets older, and. They'll trust you. Yeah, and some of that keys into just being available when they need it. Um, if you're an early to bed person and your kids aren't, you may need to stay up late more. Um, I know, and I'm not, I'm, I stay up late and the kids come home and are ready to talk um, at 11 o'clock at night sometimes. And that's when you need to be ready to talk. Um, and so making yourself available, I think helps a ton in that stage. I think we should consult Jake on that one. I'm just kidding. He, is, is he here? He would approve. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll sleep in. Um, <laughs> um, there's so much to talk about with teenage years, but we are running out of time, and I want to touch on parenting adults. Um, so, yeah, let's just jump to parenting adults. Um, there, were, there was a question there that I think is helpful, and I think there, it kind of leads into a little bit of a conversation around just how you interact with your adult children that are believing. How do you interact with ones that aren't believing? Um, what does it look like in terms of just encouraging them towards Christ? So let's start with talking about unbelieving adult kids. What does it look like to, um, like, what is your role in their life, and what does it look like to kind of shepherd them in that? Either of you guys. You're looking at me. I don't. I'm looking at you. <laughs> I don't have any of those. I know. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> uh, you said an unbelieving an adult. An unbelieving child. adult. Child. And just because we don't have them doesn't mean God's word doesn't come to bear. So Amri, you're on. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it's um, it is your loving kindness toward them that is going to turn their heads to you rather than away from you. And, of course, if they are open to uh, spiritual discussion, then you should be participating with them in, in whatever discussions you can, you can have. Um, there may be times that uh, they are in sin, and uh, you, uh, you want to walk that uh, situation very carefully, uh, because you want to continue to uh, nurture that relationship, but you want them, you want to point out also that, uh, like in uh, Galatians 5.19, that if you walk in, if you walk according to the flesh, then where is your destination? Well, it's, it's not going to be heaven. So um, you want to be truthful, you want to be uh, caring and loving, uh, and... Uh, but uh, not to uh, 
uh, compromise in in the truth, and hopefully your your demeanor and uh, the joy that you display and the the kindness and gentleness that you have toward them uh, causes them to uh, want what you have. I know, just speaking from experience, my my uh, parents' opinion matters far more to me now than it ever did growing up. And so um, my parents have, have an open door to speak into my life, into my marriage, my parenting, and I've told them that. And uh, when they currently even express approval, um, that, that's meaningful to me. Um, I think of whether your, your child's an unbeliever or a believer as an adult, the parent still can play the role of either counselor or evangelist. And so those things are, are still on the table. Just even if they weren't your child, they would still be valid categories for you to operate in. And so I don't think a, there's anything about the, the family relationship, uh, certainly that takes counseling off the table. That's just a, a bad cultural idea um, that comes from the professionalization of counseling that you shouldn't be counseled by your family members and you should go to somebody who doesn't really know you. I don't know why that makes sense, uh, but just wrong thinking. And so the, the parent for the, uh, the adult child can still, as, as much as the child will allow, speak, speak wise words, um, encourage, admonish, and instruct with the truth. And for the unbelieving child, be an evangelist. Uh, obviously, Augustine's mom is a, a just quintessential example of a, of a parent who doesn't stop laboring, uh, in prayer especially, and preaching the gospel to the child. So those are still good, good roles to play. Yeah, you can come alongside them, and, and uh, even in difficulties, you sit down and pray with them. It is... Uh, uh, very meaningful. I, I had uh, uh, several opportunities at work where uh, someone would come in and they would just, they would, something really tough was happening in their life and I just would say, well, let's sit down and, and let's pray over this. And uh, so um, uh, hardly anyone will ever deny sitting down and praying. So uh, always the opportunity to pray. What about um, grandparents? What's your, what does it look like to be a grandparent, Denny? <laughs> <laughs> what does it look, what did you, what's the um, question? <laughs> the question, what is, what is the role of a grandparent in the kids' lives? In your, in your children's lives? In your grandchildren's lives. Well, okay. Um, well, first of all, in your, in your uh, I'll, I'll go from the, your, your children's lives, is that uh, um, you come alongside them and uh, you um, um, maintain uh, communication. Uh, and that in that communication, you want to know, uh, and this relates to your grandchildren, uh, what kind of rules do you have? Uh, what uh, are their... Sometimes there are diet restrictions or whatever. So you, you just want to know as much about uh, the grandchild as possible. And so um, uh, the, uh, yeah, just coming alongside them in their parenting efforts, um, we, uh, when invited, we uh, spoke into our children's lives as far as uh, parenting uh, technique, principles, that type of thing. Uh, but we didn't do that uh, unless we were really invited to do that. And uh, we, we have had a couple of sessions with our children where <laughs> they've indicated that, uh, oh, we, uh, we think you're watching us. And the way we parent, well, we assured them that... Because we are. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> um, but then in regard to your grandchildren, uh, just using every opportunity that you can to be uh, with them and next to them, um, to speak biblically with your grandchild, uh, 
you know, that's where it gets back to your, your knowledge of the Word, just being in the Word and uh, just knowing what's going on in their lives and, and, and that type of thing and um, just express uh, love and unconditional love as much as you can. And, uh, um, um, you know, to just to, to uh, pass along uh, different things. Um, and you can, you can preach the gospel pretty, uh, uh, pretty easily in, a, in, in that situation, even to really young kids. And, uh, and uh, you know, what, uh, how were we made right with God? And uh, uh, how should we live rightly with him and for him? Uh, you can bring those phrases uh, uh, into their being. And, and you can just, uh, uh, you'd be surprised in these little guys, the, the kind of fruitful discussions that you can have, uh, you know, just uh, about uh, uh, Jesus and biblical uh, principles. So don't. Don't back off. Uh, I would hesitate to say uh, uh, invite them over, feed them full of sugar, and send them home. That's uh, that's not the role of a grandparent. And uh, so you, you try to you Some want parents. I need to talk to about that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to know as much from your kids about their kids as you possibly can, so that you can honor what's going on in their home. As we close, um, do you guys have a favorite passage or verse that rings in your head when you think about parenting? Um, I kind of shared mine. Deuteronomy 6 is always on my mind when it comes to my interactions with my kids. Um, I love that section uh, because it just reminds me how important it is to teach my kids the greatest commandment. And so that's the one that rings in my head since I put you guys on the spot and kind of gave mine away already, so. Mine is probably uh, Proverbs 3. We've been working on that as a family for a while, and uh, we just rehearsed that over and over, and just so many instructions that are uh, <laughs> pertinent to the home uh, that are evangelistic, are just excellent wisdom principles, uh, like, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Uh, to be able to remind our, our children, um, don't forget this, keep this. We give you good instructions. Um, trust in Yahweh with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear Yahweh and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Uh, I mean, that we have found just by rehearsing that so often as a family, the amount of times we use that, I use that outside of the home all the time, and it's just such helpful reminders. Um, and when our kids act it out, they get to uh, pat their bottoms on the, my son do not despise Yahweh's discipline, you know. Don't be weary of his reproof, and they are, uh, you know, good for them to know. So, I think Proverbs 3. Uh, mine is the Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the de discipline and instruction of the Lord. And uh, to bring them up means to, uh, to bring them up to maturity. And uh, that... Uh, to have a mature child that uh, uh, you have a child that is uh, that practices self-control and as a result of uh, and, and that self-control uh, we didn't talk about the angry uh, angry child um, or the uh, uh, what was the other one the uh, self-willed self it's not the that's there was a different word that we used <laughs> anyway um, so a, a, a person that uh, is self-controlled is not being controlled by passions or emotions uh, and desires. It is, um, a, and when that person has uh, understanding and insight, then he has wisdom, and he can handle situations that uh, are given to him. He can handle stress. 
He can handle diff difficult situations. And eventually, uh, that will uh, teach him responsibility. So uh, if you're defining uh, a, a mature child, it's one who has self-control, uh, practices wisdom, and is responsible. In other words, he is, he is accountable for his actions. All right, well, we're only 20 minutes past, so I'm going to close this in prayer, and then we will be available. Any of the elders, some of the guys that weren't on stage, will also be available to answer questions. <laughs> Eric, Scott, Smith. Um, so let me close this in prayer. Lord God, you are the good father. You are our example of what it means to, um, to love our children. Lord, you're the example of what it means to discipline and what it means to be able to um, just care well for us and for, for our kids by the way that you've cared for us, Lord. And so we thank you for that. We thank you for um, what you've done in our hearts. Lord, give us wisdom. Give us grace. Help us to be parents that um, honor you. Lord, help us to bring the gospel to our kids. Lord, and, and we would love to see you save every single child in this church, Lord. So use us as tools for that, and we plead with you for their souls, Lord. In your name, amen.